Well, it is good to be with you again this morning, and uh, good to see everybody, and hopefully everybody has the elements for the Lord's Supper. Hopefully you either brought those from home or got those on your way in from the entryway, because we'll be partaking of that right after uh, the lesson this morning, and then we'll sing a song. Chris will lead us in a song, and then we'll get outside right away. Uh, as we've done over the past few weeks, and the, really the past few months, we're starting this morning again with the good news, getting that out there so that we're clear on that, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and we respond to it in faith, uh, turning away from sin, confessing Jesus as the Christ, allowing ourselves to be buried with him in baptism, and at that point our sins are forgiven, the Christian life begins. And once again, we're starting today with a number of good examples of this. We have several of these today. Uh, starting with hundreds of baptisms in India just over the past few days. If you do not follow Don Iverson on social media, you really should. Don Iverson. Don is an artist in North Carolina, and as I've mentioned before, he spends half the year making a living as an artist, and then he spends the other half of the year preaching the gospel in India. And they've been doing some relief work after the pandemic or during the pandemic this past week. And we started getting updates, I think it was on Thursday, with 420 people being baptized because of what they were doing. And then 403 the next day on Friday, and then yesterday he sent out an update that 1,201 people were baptized over the past several days. And so some very good things are happening in India right now, and a lot of good work is being done. Uh, we saw online a couple days ago that Brady was baptized at the Goodlettsville congregation just north of Nashville, Tennessee. That was just a few days ago. And some of you might recognize Cliff Hand, who was up here for the last couple of years helping with the clothing giveaway. Uh, it's a little easier to see on the TV in the back or maybe on your screen at home if you're watching in that way. But uh, Cliff was able to baptize Brady this week. And the last two here were actually baptized back in 2018. But I just found out about it a few days ago for a reason, and that is these two are now getting ready to start their studies at the Bear Valley Bible Institute out in Denver, Colorado. So he's getting ready to preach the gospel full time, getting trained in that over the next couple years. And in 2018 though, Dylan and Marissa, these two were living together without being married. And they came to the understanding that that was a sin in the eyes of God. And so what they did, they went, they got a marriage license from the county clerk. They then went to the North MacArthur Church of Christ in Oklahoma City, where they were married by the preacher in his office. And then immediately they went from the preacher's office out into the baptistry, and uh, they were baptized immediately. And so this is what repentance looked like for them. They understood that what they were doing was wrong, and so they fixed it. They heard the gospel, they believed it, they turned away from sin, and then they were buried with Christ in baptism. Dylan was baptized first, and then Dylan turned around and baptized his brand new wife within 20 minutes of them being married. And that was so cool. This was a video and I actually just took a few screenshots throughout the video to uh, get their reaction there. But Dylan has an awesome beard, as you can see, and I'm a little bit jealous of that. But I'm looking forward to hearing good things as he trains to be a gospel preacher over the next couple years. And once again, we're using these people as examples. What they have done, you can do this morning. We have a baptistry downstairs. Uh, we can go to a pool somewhere in the Madison area. We can go to one of our local lakes or rivers. This is the Four Lakes Church of Christ. There's a lot of water in this city, uh, many places that we can go. But if you're ready to obey the good news in your life today, if you have any questions or concerns, uh, talk to either me or John after the service this morning, and we'd be more than happy to open the Word of God with you. This morning, I want us to return to our brief series of lessons from Genesis chapter 3. Two weeks ago, we looked primarily at the role that Satan played in the first sin. You may remember he encourages Eve to doubt the word of God. He then lies about the consequences of the sin that he was tempting them to commit. And then we looked at the temptation and the sin itself. Last week, we looked at the immediate aftermath or the consequences, the results of that first sin. As soon as they eat the forbidden fruit, Adam and Eve are overwhelmed with shame and with fear, and then they do everything in their power to shift the blame for what they have done. Adam blames God, basically, for giving him the woman, and the woman turns around and she blames the serpent. So today I want us to continue with the third in this series of four lessons in Genesis chapter 3 by looking at God's judgment on what happens here. As you can see, uh, we are moving on from the pineapple, the accursed fruit, as it's known by my dad and our family. 
And we're now looking at a picture that I took this past Sunday afternoon, just, uh, just a week ago. And this was on a hike in the Castle Mound area of the Black River State Forest, a couple hours north of here up on the interstate. It was a beautiful hike, uh, absolutely gorgeous scenery. But at one point on the hike, I felt myself floating. And I looked down only to realize that the mosquitoes were actually carrying me through the woods. I, I gained air just a little bit and I had to use the hiking stick to beat them down and then finally uh, they put me down. But it was a very good hike, although quite buggy. As we move into Genesis 3, 14 through 19, we now come to God's pronouncement of judgment. And I thought about titles about God's judgment, something along those lines, but I've titled the lesson, God Speaks. And the reason is, it's not all judgment. Adam and Eve absolutely deserve to die for what they have done. God has promised death if they do this. They did this, and so they deserve it. And yet God's response, as we'll see in just a moment, is the perfect combination of judgment and mercy. And so I want us to move through this passage today one chunk at a time by noticing what God says, first to Satan, then to Eve, and then to Adam. So let's start today by looking at God's statement to Satan. And this comes in Genesis 3, verses 14 and 15. Genesis 3, 14 and 15. So right after the back and forth between God and Adam and Eve, right after the shifting of blame, God speaks, and we come to God's judgment, starting with Satan in verses 14 and 15. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. And so we find, first of all, God curses the serpent. I find it interesting later on that God does not directly curse Adam and Eve. He adds some difficulties to their lives, but God actually curses the serpent himself. A few years ago, we were on a long hike with a bunch of kids at the youth camp up north, and I overheard some kids talking about all of the dangerous creatures out there in the woods, all of the things that can get you in the forest. And they were talking about this, and one kid piped up and said, I know that not all snakes are bad, but when it comes to a creature God has cursed, I'm not taking any chances. <laughs> and I appreciated his words there. And I know we may or may not agree with that, uh, but his plan was just to stay away from all snakes just in case. And I think we understand that. Some of us may think the same way. But I want us to understand that the main point of this passage is not that we need to be afraid of snakes. That's not what God is trying to teach here because as we transition into verse 15 and the verses that come, we'll notice that we have enmity. That is war, conflict, hatred, fighting, or constant tension between the seed or the offspring of the woman and the seed or the offspring of the serpent. And so as we keep reading, we start to understand then that this really isn't between snakes and people. That's not the conflict that's going on here. But instead, this is Satan who seems to have taken on the form of a serpent in the Garden of Eden. So I hope that makes sense. And this is where we have the first clue that the death Adam and Eve will experience is not immediate. And again, in God's judgment, it could have been. He could have struck them dead right away for doing what they did. But instead, we find in this passage that descendants will be born. Do we notice that in this passage? There is a seed involved, and so there are descendants. And so the death will not be instantaneous. There will be this ongoing, long-term conflict between Satan and the seed of the woman. And certainly we see this in the very next chapter. If you were to read ahead into Genesis chapter 4, we would notice that Cain murders his brother Abel. And at first, it's just a dispute between brothers. But in 1 John 3, verse 12, many years later, John, the apostle, will look back on this event and he will say, we should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. 
And so it wasn't just Cain operating there. It was the evil one working through Cain, influencing Cain to murder his own brother. And I believe that is the first evidence we have of this ongoing enmity or conflict between Satan and the descendants of the seed of promise. And so this continues through the years. Um, you remember Pharaoh killing all of the baby boys in Egypt, ordering them to be thrown in the Nile River? I think that was Satan working through Pharaoh to wipe out the seed of the woman. He was trying ultimately to destroy uh, the Messiah, the coming Messiah. We see the same thing with Satan working through King Herod, don't we? To kill all the baby boys within two years of the visit of the wise men to Bethlehem. That was an attempt to destroy the infant Jesus. And on and on. That's what we see in the Bible. Satan is against anyone who has any allegiance to God. The rest of the story of the Bible then, from this chapter forward, is basically a record of the conflict between Satan and the seed of the woman. It's a conflict between good and evil. And it starts here in Genesis chapter 3. The Bible is basically a long, drawn-out genealogy tracing the seed of the woman through God's promise here in verse 15. So it's not a snake that we need to be worried about here. It is Satan. Not only will this enmity be ongoing over a long-term basis, though, but I also want us to notice that it will lead to a very focused conflict at some point. And I say this because of how the pronouns change in verse 15. Notice we go from descendants to a conflict between he and you. So it's not just descendants facing each other. It's a conflict between he and you. And so this doesn't refer to the descendants of Satan, but this refers to Satan himself, something that Satan will experience personally. And this is where we seem to have the first prophecy of Jesus in the Old Testament. God says to Satan that there is a time coming when he, that is a descendant of the woman, shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. And what appears to be a reference to the death and the resurrection of Jesus. In the crucifixion, Satan bruises Jesus on the heel. He crushes his heel. It is painful and devastating. I know at least two of our members have broken their ankles and that is absolutely just, it's a horrible injury, very painful, hard to get around. It takes a long time to heal. And yet it is not a permanent victory. Satan will bruise or crush the heel of Jesus. That is in the crucifixion. On the other hand, in his resurrection, Jesus crushes Satan's head in what is truly an overwhelming, decisive victory. And so, first of all, God speaks to Satan, and in doing so, he makes the first prophecy about the coming of Jesus. This is a key passage in understanding the rest of the Bible. So we continue with God speaking now to the woman, and we see this in verse number 16. Notice, please, Genesis 3, verse 16. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children. Yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. I want us to notice as we start looking at this little verse that God starts with the natural order. There's nothing supernatural above and beyond here, but he starts with what he told the people to do anyway, which was repopulate the earth and live together as a couple. But there are some consequences of sin that make everything that they were told to do a lot more difficult. Childbearing becomes more painful according to this curse. And the rest of this is a consequence on the marriage itself. She will desire her husband, but he will rule over her. Some other translations say, your desire shall be contrary to your husband. And I think that may be a little bit more accurate. Some have suggested that the desire here is really a desire to control her husband. And I say this because the next time this word is used in Scripture is in the next chapter. If you turn ahead to Genesis 4-7, that's where God warns Cain and says that sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. It wasn't some kind of romantic desire that sin had for Cain. 
But this, the sin was trying to control Cain. It was, his desire was to dominate Cain's life. And in the same way, it seems that one consequence of the first sin is that this power struggle between husbands and wives would be an ongoing challenge. So God creates Adam first, gives him some responsibility to lead the family. As we studied a few weeks ago, he gives the command not to eat of the tree, not to Eve. She wasn't created yet. He gives that responsibility to Adam, who then in turn had to explain that to his wife. And so there is some uh, chain of command, I guess we might say there. That's not really the best way of putting it. But God gives that responsibility to Adam. And over the rest of their lives, it seems part of the curse is Eve would always be trying to take that away. And so we have this conflict introduced into the marriage relationship. We love each other in marriage, but we will always have issues. That's just the way it is. There will always be those concerns. Sin has corrupted the marriage relationship in a sense, turning it into something of a power struggle. And that's true pretty much everywhere, isn't it? It's universal. Some people would say, well, if you don't believe the Bible, you don't have those problems. But we know that's not the case. Couples all around the world, regardless of where they're from, you know, Europe or Asia, if you live on a farm or in a city, educated, uneducated, husbands and wives will always have the trouble described by Genesis 3 verse 16. Wives will have this unfillable desire and yet husbands will rule over them. And so there is this constant back and forth, God says. And there can absolutely be sin on both sides of that. This relationship can be corrupted from both angles. Uh, the wife might want to overthrow her husband's leadership in the home, as Eve seems to have done here. Or the husband, on the other hand, might want to abuse his headship of the family and lord it over his wife in, a, in an unloving or an abusive way. Uh, thankfully, as Christians, we have the New Testament that tells us how we are uh, to do these relationships. But the tension is always there, and it seems that that goes back to this curse. As we come to the end, let's notice God's message to Adam. And notice, please, Genesis 3, verses 7, or through, uh, 14 through 19, or 17 through 19, I guess it is. Then to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it, cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread, till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Obviously that opening line is a bit concerning, isn't it? That's not good, you know, because you have listened to the voice of your wife. And I think some people could obviously take the wrong lesson out of that. And yet it's not that husbands are not to listen to their wives. That's not the main point. The problem is Adam listened to his wife when she was tempting him to sin. So he listened when he should have resisted. He should have been re-explaining God's original command to her instead of her convincing him to sin. And so he listened instead of leading in this temptation circumstance. And because of this, Adam also has some consequences here. It doesn't just fall on Eve, but he gets something here too. And notice the punishment fits the crime. Like Eve, what God originally told him to do will now be a whole lot more difficult. The sin of eating the forbidden fruit now results in growing food being much more difficult for Adam. I want us to notice here that work itself is not the punishment. God doesn't say to Adam, because you sinned, now you must work for a living. That's not it. God had already commanded Adam to manage the garden. So work was already going before the first sin. But now this work will be more difficult than it was previously due to the thorns and the thistles and the weeds. If you've ever had a garden, you understand exactly what's going on here. There are, you know, some people say that, uh, that a weed is just like a misplaced flower. That's rather optimistic. There are some weeds that are malicious and they are out to get us. And I think that, you know, goes back to the original curse. Growing food will make you tired. Sometimes it will hurt you physically. Plus the whole cycle is a bit pointless, isn't it? Notice as it continues, you spend your life growing food 
And when this life is over, your body returns to the ground, which then grows more food. And it just continues. That cycle is meaningless and almost eternal. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Uh, many years ago, we had a funeral. And it was at that uh, funeral home over off of Lean Road, across from Laredo's. It's kind of back behind what used to be the Presbyterian Church. Now it's an Islamic uh, study center. But it was one of the first funerals that they ever had there. And right before the funeral began, somebody from the family ran up and they said, can you include the verse from the Bible, dust to dust, ashes to ashes? I didn't have my Bible on me. All I had was the notes for the funeral that was about to start in 10 minutes. And so I said, okay, well, let's see what we can do. The funeral home was so new, they didn't even have a Bible. And so we did the best we could. We looked it up online and we started realizing that's not a verse that's in the Bible. It's not there. The closest we could get was this passage right here. And we started look at, looking at it in context, and I had to say, I don't think that's the verse you want at a funeral. <laughs> this is in the curse for Adam for the sin that he committed. This is not something we're celebrating here today uh, with this man's life. By the way, we might not work directly with the soil too much these days in the work that all of us do, but aren't all of us pretty much working for food? in the work that we do, isn't that pretty much what it boils down to? We're working to provide food for our families. And so I would suggest then that the curse still applies, even though we're not digging in the ground and pulling weeds for the survival of our family. You might work in an office or a plant or a school or a hospital, but work is still hard. Bad things happen, things set us back, annoying coworkers, computers that crash, missed calls, long hours, doing more with less, and on and on and on. Once a blessing, work is now a pain. You know, it can be symbolically a pain. It can also be physically a pain. We suffer in the labor that we do. So this is God's judgment in these verses that we've considered. God speaks. He's just. He's merciful. Death is a consequence, but it's not immediate. There is a delay. And ultimately, he promises that a descendant of the woman will eventually, at some point, crush Satan's head. And that's the story of the whole Bible from Genesis chapter 3 forward. It's all summarized here in chapter 3. Even though we've sinned, God still loves us, and he's done some amazing things to bring us back. This morning, if you've sinned, God has made a way to make things right. He invites us to respond. And so if you can help in some way, we hope you'll get in touch. If you're listening on the phone, give me a call at 608-224-0274. Uh, before John leads us in the prayers for the Lord's Supper, let's close this lesson with a prayer. Our Father in heaven, we praise you today for responding to the first sin in your great wisdom with justice and yet with mercy and grace as well. We are thankful for the promised Messiah and we're so thankful for your book explaining who he is. Thank you for Jesus. We come to you today in his name, by his authority. Amen. In a lot of ways, we humans are forgetful creatures. Uh, in our lesson today, we, uh, or the series of lessons that we've been learning about Adam and Eve in the garden, they, they forgot to pay attention to God's word. They forgot the instruction that God gave them in a way. Uh, the children of Israel forgot over and over again how God had delivered them from the hands of the Egyptians. And on through the Bible, we see many examples of people that forget God's blessings and God's promises and the consequences of, of not serving him. So I think it's a very good thing that, that Jesus gave us a weekly memorial to help us remember him, and remember the sacrifice that he made for us. This is something that we partake of on the first day of every week that serves to keep that fresh in our minds. So with that in mind, let's go to God in prayer right now. Father in heaven, we 
thank you for every blessing of life. We thank you for allowing us to gather here this morning. Father, of all the blessings of life, we're most thankful for the Christ who came and lived a perfect life. He gave us many lessons to live by and left all that recorded in your word that we can study it and understand it today so that through obedience to your word and through the sacrifice of your son, we can have that hope of eternal life in heaven with you. Father, as we partake of this bread, help our minds to go back to remember the cross and how Jesus was nailed there for our sins. Help us to partake in a manner pleasing in your sight. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's continue. Righteous Father in heaven, we also thank you for this fruit of the vine. We pray that as we partake of this, we will think back and remember Christ's blood that was shed freely for us. Help us partake in a manner pleasing in your sight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Song number, well, a wonderful Savior. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. A wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the flesh. 